Good morning, almost afternoon. Olive, Arlo, and Frank, it's Grandpa coming to you from the back deck in beautiful Jackson Beach, Florida. And today I want to talk you, to talk you about five economic principles. So you'll hear your parents talk about the economy. Like the economy's good, the economy's bad. What does that mean? Quite simple, quite simply, the economy is the flow of money through the world population. So the global economy is the everyday flow of money gone through and how that affects people. Based on that flow of money, sometimes there's a lot of jobs or there's not that many jobs. And I'm oversimplifying this for a reason. This is not an economic treatise to turn you into miniature economists. This is, so you have a, a couple things that you can do. One of them is, <clears throat> there's, there's two of them, not peace out, two. One of them is that there's always an election going. Wherever you live in the world, whether you're free or not, or kind of free or kind of not free, whatever system you're in, they're going to at least pretend to have elections. And in some places, they have real elections. And you need to know who to vote for. The economy is almost always the number one issue because if you can't put food on your table, if you don't have a job, if you have a crappy job, if you're struggling, well, you want to have a better life. And we'll get at the very end of this, we'll talk about how to have that better life. But one of the things is you want to be able to figure out what political candidate, if I vote for them, is there a better chance that they're going to help the economy, they're going to help the, the flow of that money through the, the population. And then secondly, that, and that's macro, that's big, big picture stuff. But the micro, the, how this affects you personally, because you vote for somebody after you vote for them, they do what they do. You know, you, you can't unvote. There's ways to remove people from office, but they hardly ever get removed from office. But you want to be able to invest your money. So there's those two things, figure out who to vote for and to be able to invest your money. So I'm gonna to talk to you about five economic principles. There are five things that are better. Number one, freedom is better. Very few people in very few areas of the world during the entire history of the world have had much freedom at all. I did a, a video series on on freedom. I think it's a four video, maybe three video series. I strongly remind, remind you or recommend that you go back and watch it again if you have after watching this or watch it for the first time if you haven't. So what do I mean by freedom? Freedom to own what you want. In, in some countries, you're, you're not allowed to own property. I was talking to people yesterday who wanted to buy a home in Mexico that was right on the ocean. And, and this was 20 years ago. But an American citizen wasn't allowed to come in and buy any kind of real property in Mexico, so they, they couldn't buy it. You can, you can buy it, but you, you're kind of like getting somebody there to buy it in their name, and then you lease it, you rent it from them, and that's just insane. So freedom to own what we want, freedom to do what we want. Frank, you're an adult now. If you act like an adult, you should be allowed to do anything you want. 
uh, oftentimes we try to tell people, this is what you're allowed to do. I don't like when you do this. So you're only allowed to do that. Like, well, it's none of your business. If I'm not harming someone to do whatever I want. I'm not gonna get into the specifics of it. And this thing, the freedom to do what you want, you need to guard it tenaciously. Here's a, a quote from a hero of mine, Benjamin Franklin, who was one of the founding fathers of the United States. He was from Philadelphia, which is where I'm from. And he said, those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. That's what we're asked to do all the time. Oh, there's a war, so you need to give up these freedoms so we can win the war. No, we should never have to give up our freedoms. Quite often we should just give up the war, but that's for another video. The freedom to enter into contracts. So this is part of the smaller economic picture, the microeconomic picture, not the macro, the big economic picture, is if I want something and you have it and I buy it, then I sign a contract. Say I buy a car. I sign a contract and the person with the car signs that contract and that car changes ownership to, to be mine. When you purchase a house, whoever owned it before has a deed that they've had since they bought it and they deed that over to you. That's a contract. They're legally binding. Once that deed is signed, that's your house. That person can't come back and go like, oh, I changed my mind. That's very, very important too. Now contracts are, there's all kinds of contracts. There's actually part of law called contract law. You take, when you go to work for somebody, you're entering into a contract with them. They say, we need you to do this work and we'll give you this much pay. If you don't do that work and or, you know, as much as they want, as little as they want, then they can say, well, I'm not gonna give you the money. You're in breach of your contract. You, you've, you've reneged on the contract. You, you've, you've disregarded the contract. <clears throat> so these are very important. There's, there's uh, three of them. Freedom to own what we want, freedom to do what we want, and freedom to enter into contracts. Now, because you want these freedoms for yourself, you have to be willing to give them to people and expect it back in return. Like, you want to enter into contracts? It, it, you know, there's people that want to marry their dog. It's the stupidest idea in the world. But if they don't hurt the dog, and, and, and break some sort of law against whatever, the, you know, animal abuse. They want to say that that dog's their husband or wife. Hey, God bless you. I, it's not what I would do, but I have to honor that person's right to enter into a contract as long as it doesn't harm someone, or in this case, something, an animal. So you give freedom and you expect it back in return. So let's go on to the second thing. Smaller is bigger. There's the right wing and left wing in America. The left wing is bigger government. In, in theory, <laughs> these are their, their, their positions. Left wing, bigger government right-wing, smaller government. Well, I'm not really a right-winger, but as far as economics is concerned, I am, because smaller is better. Smaller government, smaller, smaller everything. We'll, we'll talk about that. A lot of times when you work 
at a company or for the federal government or any, any work for anybody. They'll have things that they need to do and they'll say, well, we're doing them everywhere, but if we could centralize the effort, if we could do it all in one place, it would become more efficient. And, and a lot of times in those bureaucracies, that works. That's microeconomics again, the micro, the small part of economics. So in, in a factory, if you centralize things, it's good. But on the macroeconomic level, the big picture level, the 30,000, you know, let's look at it from 30,000 feet up. It's not good. In societies, centralization always takes power away from the individual people. And it's never a good thing. In the United States, we have the two big parties, and, and when one of them's in power, and they have the presidency, the Senate, the uh, House of Representatives, and a majority of, of the Supreme Court, oh, they get all their stuff passed, all their legislation that they want to get passed. We're going to make the economy like rip-roar, and it's going to be great. And guess what? It's never a good thing. They, they never accomplish what they set out to do. They usually make things worse. The only time it's good in this country is when you have something called gridlock, when each party has part of the power and neither of them have enough to push through their agenda and force their ideas on everybody else. And everybody's like, oh, I hate the gridlock in Washington, in Congress. They're not getting anything done. But when they're not getting anything done, they're leaving us alone. That's not a bad thing, kids. Gridlock is good. In society, and, and government is the way that we control society. And society is where the money flows through, which is the, 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 is the economy. The money thrown flowing through the society. So the society is all the people in whatever size. You, there's a society in, in Florida. There's a society in Jacksonville. There's one in Jacksonville Beach. I'm not saying it's called the Society of Jacksonville Beach, but it's the, the people, the sum total of all the people. That's the society that you're in. In society, you don't want efficiency. You want a voice. Yeah, you want your trash picked up on trash day. You want the streets to be clean and you want the police force to be helpful and friendly and not an enemy, of course. But for the most part, you want your voice to be And when your voice is taken from you, you want to be able to walk away to a place where your voice will be heard. So if, if, and, and so what I mean by this is the smaller the situation that you're stuck in right now, where you don't have a voice, where nobody will listen to you, if it's a small situation that you're stuck in, it's a shorter walk to get to the next place. So in the United States, we have 50 states. We actually have 46 states and four commonwealths, but essentially we have 50 states. And people get driven crazy because they say, well, let's just have the same law throughout the entire United States, but that's no good. I'll use abortion as an example. In Florida, if abortion isn't illegal now, it probably will be in the next couple of years. But you can get on a bus and go to another state 
like I know in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, it's legal. And you're a U.S. citizen. You can go state to state. It's not like being in, you know, like in Asia where you have to use a passport to get across the Chinese border into Tibet or anything like that. So you, you can freely travel anywhere in the United States. And there's more pro-abortion states than anti-abortion states. So if, if that's something that you believe in, and I'm not, this is not about abortion. I'm not talking to you about the issue of abortion. I'm just using it as an example. You can go, they're available. But if we had one big country and they said, okay, you can't have an abortion. Well, where are you gonna go? You're gonna have to figure out how to go to another country where you get one. So it's easier to, to leave because that's, you feel like you don't have your voice. They're not listening to you. I need to remove this child from me. I need to do that. Well, you, you can go do that someplace in the United States. But if we have one law, you better hope the law is the one that you want and not the one that you don't want. Now, by the same token, if, if you're so virulently anti-abortion that you say, I could never live in a place where abortion's legal, and we had one law in, in the whole United States about it, and the law was that it was legal. Now, what, are you going to leave and go to another country? But here, you could go from wherever you live, like Illinois, you could say, okay, well, I'm going to, I'm going to move to Texas, where abortion is illegal. So that's, that's another reason why smaller is better. It's, it's, it's better... And it's, it's usually even better at the micro level, normally because it's more controllable by, by the people that are actually involved in the day-to-day -day business. <clears throat> but if it's ever gonna work, if centralization is ever gonna work, it's gonna work at the smaller level. Now the third thing that's better is the truth. And I just did a, a, a video on truth very recently. What is truth better than? Well, I wrote down three things. Our downloaded world views. By downloaded, I mean what you learned from your parents what you learn from your teachers, what you learn from TV, what you learn from your friends, what you believe about the world, how you see the world. Is the world a good place? Is it a bad place? Are things rigged against you? You know, are you gonna, hey, someday I'm gonna be a billionaire and really, really happy? Like the way you view the world is based on downloads to you from others. You didn't dream that stuff up yourself. There's nothing new under the sun. The second thing is our delusions. And delusions are thing that we, things that we believe that are not true. And, but a delusion is even more than like, hey, I believe this and it's not true. It's, it's almost like you're you're playing it out. A couple perfect examples. Don Quixote. It's a um, probably the most awesome book in Spanish language by a guy named Cervantes. I had always hoped to be able to read it in Spanish someday, but the Espanol knows bueno. Although I should say, uh, mi castellano no es bueno, because that's Spanish Spanish, not New World Spanish. Don Quixote 
was a guy who all of a sudden wanted to save the world. And so he became a, a, a knight. And he went around on a, on, a, on a donkey with this like long stick. And he, and he tried to save the world. He had this guy named Pancho, Pancho Sanchez, I think. His buddy, and his buddy was a lot smarter than him, but he was not, not his buddy as much as a servant who was there to serve him and make sure everything was all right. So he was a knight, he's going around and he saw a windmill on the, the thing spinning and, and he went up and started jousting it. So that's what we call jousting at windmills. If you say somebody's jousting at windmills, it, it means that they're starting a fight that doesn't, doesn't matter. There's, there's no end to the fight. You're not gonna win the fight. Or <laughs> your grandmother watches shows on TV about cops and the FBI and Secret Service and all this kind of stuff and they have these thin supermodel FBI agents, you know, pulling 45 automatics out and holding them like this and going like, yeah, oh, I'll shoot, bam, 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 bam. It's, it's like unrealistic, it's delusional. That person could never stand there and hold that gun and shoot it like that. If a big, strong man couldn't do that. But they want to project like, this is, it, it, this is what your hero should look like. This tall, skinny, blonde haired lady that probably doesn't eat enough every day. It's probably anorexic and bulimic and all those other things. But she's the FBI agent. If you go meet FBI agents, you're not going to really see any of those kind of people. And they're not running around shooting people. They, 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 I didn't look up the statistics for FBI shootings, but they're, they're not like being a cop. Cops shoot people Regularly, there are, there are stories in the United States about cops shooting people or being in shootouts with people. That doesn't normally happen with the FBI. Few and far between. So it's delusional, and, you, and you're getting that. You're watching TV, and you go, oh, I, I want to be an FBI agent, so I'm going to grow up to be tall and skinny and not eat enough and learn how to shoot, bam, bam, bam. Now, how does this play out? It plays out by people who are delusional saying, well, they don't understand me. They don't like me. I, I'm reading a book right now by a guy, and, and he seems like the, a very nice man, but he's 300 pounds, and, and he's a black man. And he, and he talks about how he is oppressed because people make fun of him and people, like he'll go to a race and, and people make fun of him. Well, I've been at races with all kinds of people. He, he said it's hard to be a black man and be a runner. Well, the probably 10 fastest men in the world are black men and, and <laughs> two thirds of the, Olympic track team is black men and black women every four years. So, like, I don't get it. He's delusional. And it's a shame because he's a big man and he runs. He's got a lot of information to share, but he keeps trying to make you download these crazy views. He talks about how he's running through neighborhoods and cops are throwing him up on the hood of the police car. And it's like, well, in most metropolitan areas, and I pretty sure he lives in a, in a metropolitan area. They're, they're multicultural police forces, so that it's not like a whole bunch of white cops show up. There, there's all kinds of cops. They're, the neighbors have cell phones, they're taking pictures. It's just very hard to be in the oppression business these days. And, and it, so it makes you say, well, is, is this guy lying? And I don't think that he is. I, think that he's just delusional. And you have to guard about that. Your worldview has to be based on reality. The reality of what you see. 
and I'll tell you why. And you know, well, Grandpa, what are you talking about all this stuff for? Are you talking about economics? Well, economies weed out the weak. And people that say like, well, you don't understand me, and you don't like me, and and and, and you're picking on me. To society in general, that they're weak. So in the job market and in the financial market, they're going to lose because they're not used to looking at reality and saying, well, I need to react to reality. So that's the first two, our downloaded worldviews and our delusions. And the third one is our, our biases. I, I did a whole video, well, two video series, or maybe even a three video series on fallacies it's it's kind of from argumentation they're called logical fallacies and they don't necessarily mean that that something's not true if you say well that's a logical fallacy because you did this it doesn't mean that hey it's not true because it's a logical fallacy it just means we well, haven't proved it because the way you're trying to prove it is illogical. It doesn't make sense, it doesn't prove it. So you're gonna to have to come up with something better. <clears throat> and a couple of them is confirmation bias. I'm just gonna mention two. Confirmation bias, which is that um, when you're not looking for facts, when you say, oh, I'm doing the research, you've already decided what you wanna do and you're just looking for things that back up what you already believe. And you need to not be like that. You, you need to be a person who can say, let me follow the facts. Let me follow the evidence and see where it leads me. And if it's an economic decision, let me make it based on facts, not on fallacies. And the other is the attribution error, fundamental attribution error, which says that if you do something wrong, it's because of the situation. You were put in a situation, you had to do something wrong. You know, I, I stole from the grocery store because my children hadn't eaten in three days and they were crying and I had no money and I went to the grocery store and I stole. That's why I did it because I had to. I had to do something wrong. I know st that stealing things is wrong, but I had to do it. That's when you do it. But if somebody else does it, it's because that's just the kind of person they are. You know, you cut somebody off in traffic because you're in a rush to get to the hospital with your kid because you think he broke his leg and you want to get there, get him seen, you're worried cut somebody off in traffic you go yeah how to do that I'm sure that person will forgive me and you drive off but that person's gone no that SOB is the kind of person that just cuts you off in traffic because he doesn't care so we never think other people have a reason for doing things we only think that we have a reason for doing things we don't want to judge people that way we don't want to judge ideas based on the confirmation bias, and we don't want to judge people based on the fundamental attribution error. I strongly suggest you go and watch the, the videos. Now, why is truth better than all these other things? You want to win in life. And it's hard enough to win when you're facing reality, let alone winning when you're dealing with your skewed worldviews, delusions, and biases. Right? It just makes sense. You want to get rid of as much of that garbage as you can and be making decisions, economic decisions, based on facts. 
So what's the fourth thing that's better? Markets are better. I'm not talking about the supermarket or anything like that. Although supermarkets are better than what they have in communist countries, which are they're called supermarkets, but there's hardly anything available in them. You get what the government says you can have. What I'm talking about is the stock market, the, the economy in general, that money flowing through society, the, um, the housing market, the gold market, the, the options market, all these things. It's wherever things are bought and sold. Quite, quite honestly, it comes down to that. There's a couple things about it. Markets will break your heart. Because we always want to be the smartest guy in the room. But the second thing is that markets are always the smartest guy in the room. They're even smarter than that guy who has so much money that he can appear to control the market. The market always wins in a free society where the government doesn't put their thumb on the scale and say, hey, we're not. You know, the current housing market, people say, oh, it's good, it's bad. It doesn't matter. Like, there are always going to be some people say, oh, it's good, it's bad. And, but occasionally it gets really, really bad. And that's usually the time to buy a house. It's never the right time to buy a house. It's just never the right time. It's never the right time to buy a house, never the right time to have a kid, never the right time to get married, never the right time to you know, look for a new job, never the right time to take a new job. It's never the right time, but you need to do it. You need a house, you need a place to live. So, you know, the, the housing market has been good to, to your grandmother and me and bad. We, we sold the house in Stone Harbor when the great grandparents passed away and, and that caused us to be able to, to go and buy a place for us. And, uh, you know, after everything was distributed to the people that it was, you know, the beneficiaries that, uh, or the heirs, I should say. You know, we took our money and, and we bought a place to live with some of it. And that became worth more than what we bought it for. And we sold that and bought another place up in New Jersey, closer to where your grandmother and I worked. And then the housing market went like into the crapper. And we lost a lot of money on that. But we were living in Miami, renting for a year, and we're looking for that, for a house to live in while we lived there. And we found the house on, on uh, Santander, Avenida Santander. It, uh, it was at the very depths of the market. But it's not like I'm a smart man. I needed to buy a house. And I had this much money and I bought this house. And then when we sold it, it, it had gone up. But then it was at the top of the market and the, and the market was starting to tank again. And so we didn't get quite as much as we wanted, but we had enough to, to buy this place here. And, and we love this place, and we really don't care now whether this goes up in value or down in value. <laughs> Your parents do, but um, my grandmother and I don't. So you have to base things on, I need to make the be best decision that I can right now. And sometimes you do want to wait. If the housing market is really heated up, you might want to wait, but you might have to wait for a couple of years. So there's that. So you're still paying rent for a couple of years while you're waiting to, to get a house. And if you're saving up more money, well, that's good. You can buy a better house. 
when the market crashes. But trust me, the market's always going to be the smartest guy in the room. <clears throat> and then the way that you look at investing. So let's talk about commodities and options. And, and commodities are they're fungible. They're, and that means that every one of them look the same, essentially. So if you buy plywood, I don't know what the contracts in plywood are. You buy these futures of I'm going to I'm going to buy this much plywood. You know, enough to do a whole housing development. I think the contracts are for and I'm going to have it delivered on this day and I'm willing to pay this much. And on the day that that expires, you're supposed to buy that. But nobody Usually, I should say, not nobody. Usually, people don't take delivery on them. They're they're buying and selling based on their business. Now they they buy plywood to um, build houses, and as as insurance for them, they'll buy a plywood futures contract, and then they'll liquidate it at the end. And the thing is, is is that if plywood skyrockets in price, they've already set the price that they're charging to build these houses. So what are they gonna do? Are they just gonna eat that loss? Well, no, because the future price went up. And so they, when they liquidate that, they, they say, okay, well, we're gonna lose whatever, $50,000 because of how much more it costs us to buy the plywood but we have right around $50,000 here that we got by this going up. And if, and if plywood prices go down, then that contract is worthless and they don't care. They just let it expire because it was the cost of, of buying insurance. But on the other side of that, the people providing the money are speculators. And they're just going, I think the price of plywood's going up, so I'm going to buy these contracts. Or options, which is the option to buy the contract or the option to buy the stock. It, it means that, that on a certain day you can buy it or you can sell it. And I'm not going to get into the whole options market. But there's all these things that you can do, but you have to realize the risk involved. If you buy stock in the stock market, you're investing people working in companies who are trying to provide goods and services to the community. If you start trading options, you're purely a speculator. There's nothing wrong with that, but I would make that a very small part of your portfolio and, and investing in people, the larger part. Another thing I want to talk about is contrarianism, and I've made some money, and, and I don't have a lot of money in the stock market now, I have very little, and I've never had a ton of money in it, but I've always had some money working for, since the mid-1980s, I had some money on Wall Street. And one thing that I found helpful is to be a contrarian. I read a book, I don't even remember the name of the book, it was about um, I think it was about making money in the futures market. But it, it said something is that the crowd is always wrong. So when everybody's saying, oh, AI, everybody's saying, AI, AI. Uh, probably not so much AI. The thing that's, that's going to make money for people is the thing nobody's talking about. So what you don't want to do when you invest and you, you use the economy for your benefit is to be like a cat. You, humans take a laser pointer and go like eh, all over the floor and then the cat just eh, tries to catch it because they don't know that it's uncatchable. And it's not like they learn. The next day you do it and they don't go like, yeah, I know I can't catch that thing. Don't try again. And investors are like that. You don't want to be like that. You, you don't want to let the market just suck money out of you by you following the trend because 
the real smart guys aren't going with the crowd, they're going against it. And and, and the thing is, I, it, in this book they said, there's only two things you need to be a successful investor. You, you have to be going against the crowd and you have to be correct. And you say, well, yeah, that's stupid because how do you know if you're correct? You don't, but you do know that the crowd is incorrect. So there's a better chance of you being successful because the crowd's not going to be successful over the long run. There's more chance of you being successful by going against the crowd because you know that they're wrong. You don't know which right you want to pick. Like there's a zillion things you can do that are going against the crowd. You don't know which one of them is the right one, but you know that you have a better chance. And you always want to make sure that your chances are better than worse. It, so what's, what's my advice? And I'm, I'm planning on doing a, a, an investment one that'll go into this in depth, but I'll just go into it because we're talking about economics and we're talking about like, okay, you want to know who to vote for? You want to know how to invest your money? Or what to invest your money in? Is invest in people filling a need. And there's a thing that people use when they're making decisions that's, that's good, better, best. So you don't want to do the, the worst or the bad, and I'm not, going to, I'm not even going to go into that. I'm going to do the good, the better, and best of investing in people to fill a need. <clears throat> it's good to invest in people who are filling a current need. This is, the, we're talking about a need that everybody needs, that everybody knows we have. You know, providing water on an ongoing basis to a community, that kind of thing. But it's better to invest in someone who's filling a need, and by someone, I'm talking about companies normally, not a person. Although there's a person there that has the vision. There's an Elon Musk in every company. They just aren't big time like Elon Musk. So you need to invest in somebody filling an urgent need. So timing's really important. Sometimes something's a, a current need and then there's a short supply of it. Somebody else might come in and say, I know a better way to provide that water to that community. And they do that. They make a ton of money. But there's an even better, and that's the best. And that's by filling a need that most people don't even know we have. That's re really hard. A lot of that's going to come down to luck. People go, oh, yeah, I saw it coming. I bought Apple at $5 a share. And I don't know how many people that I know that aren't millionaires that bought Apple at $5 a share. And, and maybe a couple of them really did. And maybe one of those who really did didn't sell it at $10 a share and go, ooh, doubled my money. So that's the best, good, better, and best. Current need, urgent need, and a need people don't even know we have yet. A need that hasn't been identified. That's like, you could become a billionaire if you figure out how to invest in that. And before I segue into the last thing, which is that hard work is better. And it's easy to figure out what it's better than, like not working hard. Is study the markets, but don't be obsessed with them. You'll be like that cat chasing the laser beam. 
you want to be familiar with the markets. But if you read a whole ton of articles and listen to podcasts and all this kind of stuff all the time, it's not like you're going to make better decisions normally. I'm saying, I'm not saying to don't research. Because you want to research. If you're buying a stock, you want to know what the company does and, and, and are they financially sound and what success have they had in the past and that kind of thing. But I'm talking about following market trends. Oh, well, this is the next big, big thing. It's, it's usually not. It, the next, people think the next big thing is coming in the future, but it's usually the current thing. It's just that they didn't know it was a current thing before. So don't obsess about it. But in closing, hard work is better. And it's actually better than markets and, and everything else. Because when, when we're talking about investing, because the best thing to invest in in your life is you. And you invest in it by trying to put yourself into positions where you can prosper and work in your butt off to make your dreams come true. Make something, that's how to create worth. You know who made a lot more than all the people that bought Tesla at the very beginning. And I'm sure there's, there's some millionaires that like, are purely millionaires because they bought some Tesla stock and held on to it. But you know who made more? Elon freaking Musk. The guy that started the company. He didn't invest in other people. He invested in him. By the time you're watching this, Elon Musk might be dead and gone, he might be an old man, he might be irrelevant, but whoever it is in the current day that you're watching this that is very, very successful, but they invested in them, and it's hard work. So, but not everybody who works hard becomes successful. Some of them are abject failures. Well, you have to create something. You have to create things that people need. Once again, we go back to, is it a current need? You'll do good. Is it an urgent need that you're, that you're satisfying? You'll do better. But if it's a need that other people don't even know they have yet, then you can become amazingly wealthy. And not that that's the be all, the end all. You might be amazingly wealthy and amazingly sad at the same time. And I suspect most billionaires are not happy people. Because a lot of them, that's all they have. <clears throat> you need a well-rounded life. But you need to work hard at it to create wealth. You have to, to have a vision. You have to be able to present a way to solve a problem for society or for a company. You know, whatever it is, if you, if you go to work for a company, you need to be able to solve their problems. So you need to have a vision. This is how I'm going to solve your problem. That's why you want to hire me. And that's why you want to give me a good salary. You don't want to hire me to just, like, sweep up after everybody leaves at the end of the day. There's a lot of uh, hard-working janitors, and they don't make much money. And then invest in others that make things. When, when you become successful by working hard at it, then you can start to better invest in, in companies, in other people that, that make things for people. But the best way to go there is to, is to just work your, your butt off. This tea is very cold. So, five economic principles we looked at. Freedom is better. Smaller is better. The truth is better. Markets are better. And hard work is better.
Go out there, do the best you can. Still, the chips are gonna fall where they may. And I'll love you no matter how successful you are or aren't. But I will respect you if you at least give it the effort. Put the hard work in. Invest in yourself. It's, a, it's the best out of all of them. Invest in you. Peace out from Grandpa.